Hi, um, I'm Anna Darling. I'm here with Aram Kolasar, and we are friends and colleagues in the Point Park Clinical Psych uh, doctoral program. We are both second years. Um, we are here today. Thank you, Division 32. Um, we are here to talk about neoliberalism, how it affects individuals, um, what neoliberal subjectivity looks like, um, and what we're kind of seeing with our clients that relates to that and, and what we're seeing um, kind of how that relates to this cultural moment in, that, in this particular context. So um, we're, we also um, have an interest in a hermeneutic approach to therapy and believe that um, certain aspects of the hermeneutic approach um, can address some of the issues and problems of living that come as a result of uh, neoliberal subjectivity. So um, yeah, so we want to just explore that with you. Um, Aram and I both have Marxist leanings. So uh, we've both been kind of integrating uh, political ideas um, with, with the new content that we're learning as we're training as uh, practitioners. And um, this is kind of uh, what we've come up with and some of the ideas we're interested in. All right, thank you, Anna. Um, I uh, am going to start out just talking about neoliberalism, trying to kind of delineate what we're talking about and how we're conceptualizing this um, before moving into questions of how neoliberalism manifests itself in subjectivity and identity formation. Um, so, uh, let me just uh, begin here. Okay, Anna, do you mind uh, pausing the... All right, so um, I'm just gonna start by uh, going over some quotes of uh, how people are conceptualizing neoliberalism. Uh, there's considerable debate about what characterizes this term, and some people argue that it is just a pejorative term, functionally meaningless, uh, used by activists to refer to anything bad. So I think it's important to sort of lay out the outlines of what we're talking about when we say neoliberalism. David Harvey, in his foundational text, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, defines it thus. Neoliberalism is in the first instance a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. Now, there's something about neoliberalism that sets it apart from traditional capitalism, um, which Zygmunt Bauman refers to as liquidity, Mark Fisher calls flexibility, and Chung Byul Han refers to as transparency. Uh, and to illustrate that, I'm going to continue with these quotes. Zygmunt Bauman describing neoliberal, ne neoliberalism says, postmodern society engages its members primarily in their capacity as consumers rather than producers. Life organized around consumption must do without norms. It is guided by seduction, ever rising desires and volatile wishes, no longer by normative regulation. No particular Joneses offer a reference point for one's own successful life. A society of consumers is one of universal comparison and the sky is the only limit. Now, what I think Bauman is getting at here is the importance of consumer culture to neoliberalism. Um, and this is sort of an extension of the free market and of consumer culture to all aspects of life. So that one's idea of the good life and one's values really become more like consumer choices. Um, you make this sort of modular identity uh, or modular way of life almost as though you were picking items off of the shelf at the supermarket. Um, so continuing with this, Mark Fisher says, the rigidity of the Fordist production line gave way to a new flexibility 
a word that will send chills of recognition down the spine of every worker today. This flexibility was defined by a deregulation of capital and labor, with the workforce being casualized, with an increasing number of workers employed on a temporary basis and outsourced. So this also uh, refers to, as David Harvey did, to private property and free markets. Um, this idea that uh, neoliberalism extends the market to, uh, has an agenda of deregul deregulation, of uh, reducing taxation, and reducing any kind of um, uh, interference in the free market. And additionally, the paradigmatic neoliberal employment is casual, temporary, um, might have unusual hours. Uh, it's, a, it's a job where there's precarity, a lack of stability and safety in the job, um, and often um, a sort of entrepreneurial attitude. So things like the gig economy, working, you know, driving for Uber or delivering for DoorDash or what have you, um, this is kind of the future of neoliberal employment. Uh, you're your own boss, you're limited only by your own level of exhaustion, you can work as many or as few hours as you want, no one is breathing down your neck, and yet you are enmeshed in poverty. Chung Byul Han uh, says, to be sure, power can express itself as violence or repression, but it is not based on force. Power need not exclude, prohibit, or censor, nor does it stand opposed to freedom. Instead, power can even use freedom to its own ends. Only in its negative form does power manifest itself as a violence that says no by shattering the will and annulling freedom. Today, power is assuming increasingly permissive forms. In its permissivity, indeed in its friendliness, power is shedding its negativity and presenting itself as freedom. So this is really capturing that aspect of liquidity flexibility, transparency, this idea that uh, disciplinary um, capitalism or disciplinary modes of production have given way to a proliferation of options, a prolifer proliferation of life choices, of possible ways to live, um, which are perceived as freedom. But there is still a centrality of the marketplace such that you can live your life any way that you want, you can have any vision of the good life, any values, so long as you can make it work in the market. You can make it pay for itself or you can pay for it. So neoliberal ideology in a nutshell, the freer the market, the freer the people. In this view, government services and regulation abrogate freedom. Uh, even social safety nets abrogate freedom. Interference in the market stifles innovation. So it's most important that you have a very free market um, and you can look at, at uh, the responses to Obama's uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, uh, to see the way that this manifested. For instance, a uh, great number of um, people were convinced that limiting the freedom of insurance companies to set prices and to uh, you know, deny people care and all of this kind of thing was actually limiting their freedom um, because limiting the insurance company's freedom is, is limiting the consumer's freedom or the consumer's freedom to choose or make choices, even though really uh, having better and um, more regulated care was generally in the interest of most working people. So neoliberalism was formulated in opposition to bureaucracy and interference in personal freedom. Um, there is a sort of utopian aspect to neoliberalism, at least in theory, uh, the idea being that um, it would free us from uh, people who would be, uh, you know, these systems of bureaucracy and these sort of um, reified uh, structures of authority and control. So neoliberalism is a socially permissive order. It's free of external controls and um, free of any kind of compulsory morality. And another aspect of this was a shift from production processes to a focus on production targets. Um, and this limited bureaucracy by allowing workers to do tasks however they wanted, as long as they were able to make targets. Um, so no one was going to tell you how to do your job. Uh, you would just get fired if you don't uh, make the target. The market, the free market, is the arbiter of 
what is feasible in a neoliberal society. Uh, again, you can have any view of the good life as long as you can make it uh, economically work for you. This is just an intensified bootstraps ideology. The uh, individual is seen as responsible for his own success or failure in society. Uh, and so this creates a kind of subjectivity, a neoliberal subjectivity that is entrepreneurial, opportunistic, and self-defining. Uh, the neoliberal worker is looking out for themselves, looking for opportunities to innovate and advance and uh, get ahead. And uh, society is seen as just an aggregate of these autonomous, self-interested individuals. There is no social fabric or web of connections of interpersonal relations that holds these people together. It's every man for himself. And uh, if you choose to take someone along with you, then you also take on the risk of those interpersonal burdens. Uh, a, and as, as I mentioned before, flexibility, uh, capable to adapting to the exigencies of production. This is an important part of neoliberal subjectivity. So there's a, a very famous quote uh, by Margaret Thatcher. Um, I, I don't think you're allowed to write a uh, paper on neoliberalism without mentioning it, um, where uh, she says, who is society? There is no such thing. There are individual men and women, and there are families, and no government can do anything except through people, and people look to themselves first. And against this, critical theorist Wendy Brown says, if we go to the kind of extreme individualism rooted in families and understand those individuals as simply economic and moral actors, in an order where they pursue their own good and pursue their own values and their own beliefs and get rid of this domain we call society, we have eliminated two important things. We've eliminated the domain where we actually live together, not just as individuals and households, but live together in a world. But we've also eliminated the space where thinkers like Marx and other social theorists of equality and inequality identify the powers that subject some groups, elevate others, exclude or marginalize. We've eliminated the space where racism and sexism and, of course, class operate. That's exactly what the neoliberals wanted eliminated. They wanted to eliminate this idea that there is a web of connections among us that subordinate some and elevate others. They wanted to eliminate the web of connections and connecting powers among us that both potentially bind us together in common, but also stratify and alienate, atomize, and pit us against one another. So again, here you can see that there is a sort of utopianism at the core of uh, neoliberalism uh, that, you know, it is attempting to make everyone uh, equal in a, in a from, from the perspective of procedure and from the perspective of the market. Everyone is free to compete in the market. Um, however, of course, it is naive about the fact that people are starting out in the market with different uh, levels of privilege and uh, different economic advantages and so on and so forth. Um, and when, she, when Wendy Brown is discussing eliminating the space where racism and sexism and class operate, she, she's not saying that these, these problems have gone away by any means, but we've lost the critical tools to recognize how to solve these problems as they manifest in a macro scale in society. And rather, we start to look to individual solutions to these problems, uh, individual solutions to racism, individual problems, uh, solutions to sexism, etc. And so this sort of starts to touch on why there is so such an epidemic of mental distress in neoliberal society. Well, first of all, we have suspicion towards social determinants of identity, the traditional determinants of identity that uh, you're born into rather than given. So the current contemporary model of the self is that the self is discovered rather than given. We go, we, we, we have journeys of self-discovery. Uh, it's no longer the case that you're born into a position in society which basically dictates your life chances and life choices. Uh, rather, you can create your own uh, vision of the good life, your own way of living, so long, again, as you can make it work economically. So there's a sense that unquestioning adherence to tradition is inauthentic. If we just accept unquestioningly the spiritual values, the living values, uh, the fashions, the ways of life of our parents and our grandparents, if we do that without questioning it, well, from a neoliberal perspective, we're not quite fully realized subjectivities. 
And so you can see this in media with the emergence and popularization of an anti-hero archetype, which is the individual defined in opposition to codes of decorum, social roles, and interpersonal commitments. Uh, that's a maverick who gets the job done, a radical individual whose idiosyncrasies uh, do not interfere with meeting production targets. So another cause of the mental distress in neoliberal society, besides having to answer all of these questions about ourselves that we never used to, never even used to be questions, uh, is there's also a pressure to achieve productivity, to constantly be improving oneself, being productive, um, getting ahead, uh, finding opportunities. There's a pressure to be self-disciplined. And absent outmoded uh, forms of workplace discipline and management, the neoliberal worker disciplines and monitors herself. This lack of management and workplace solid solidarity absolve employers of the responsibility to even make the targets reasonable. They just can put a target out there and hope that their workers will uh, work as hard as they can to try to achieve it. And again, the sky is the limit. Uh, I'm going to just sort of wrap this up here with a quote from Harris and Richardson, um, which kind of touches on this question of, of identity and of creating a self. There's often a great price for the relative absence of such shared meanings and coping strategies in our kind of society, by which he means neoliberalism. To an often impossible extent, individuals have to devise or invent answers of their own to human life's many stresses and crises of meaning. With limited experience and resources, operating in considerable emotional isolation, they have to innovate many of their own coping techniques, workable defenses, credible answers to ethical dilemmas, or convincing, consoling, or meaning-giving philosophical or religious beliefs. Moreover, they have to cope actively and often through personal control, direct action, and confrontation with others. Thus, they may be saddled with excessive personal responsibility in a situation of limited resources and support, a virtual recipe for chronic emotional strain and idiosyncratic, unreliable coping. This is the situation in which we as psychotherapists find ourselves. We're working with clients who have internalized demands not only to be productive individuals, but to make themselves attractive products. We believe that much of the epidemic of mental health is attributable to neoliberal subjectivity. Young people no longer have to meet the, the demands of disciplinary authorities, but rather the endlessly receding standards of the anonymous other of social media. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand this off to Anna. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit further about neoliberal subjectivity, what it looks like to be um, uh, individual influenced by this order. So um, I'm offering just a very simple uh, definition of neoliberalism to kind of uh, focus on to think about how this affects the individual. Um, so an assimilation of an ever increasing number of domains of life to the logic of the market. So this means for the individual, there's an internalization of market forces. Um, unwittingly, their uh, will, their desires start to become aligned in a way and, and what we can imagine for ourselves um, is limited by market forces. So um, this uh, leads us to prov um, prioritizing the individual or consumer uh, versus the community, the commons, the culture, the things that we share, the things that connect us to one another. Um, neoliberalism may allow us to preserve parts of culture, um, but they cannot interfere with capitalist accumulation and workplace discipline. So um, there may be uh, symbolic gestures made um, to, uh, by a corporation to show that they um, celebrate diversity or they um, prop up a culture in a particular way, but you'll um, know how to differentiate um, between something that's more symbolic and something that uh, interferes structurally. So there's a difference. Um, another thing is um, uh, the, the individual is um, uh, has a um, is characterized by a consumer drive, a strong consumer drive. Um, we're kind of sorted in a in a neoliberal order. We're sorted um, as a population into market shares, 
and taste communities. So we have the things we're particularly interested in are of use and can be kind of co-opted by um, a, a corporate capitalist neoliberal um, economic structure. So, um, and uh, self, we self-define, the individual defines who they are um, and they do this through patterns of consumption unwittingly. So um, this is a quote from Lawrence Kermeyer, um, to be a person is to be a unique individual. Each individual is autonomous and uniquely deserving of the free pursuit of his or her own private goals. People are valued for how richly developed and articulated their inner sense of self is and how strong and coherent their self-direction. Ignoring the paradox that this uniqueness is expressed almost entirely through choices of mass produced food, clothing, automobiles, and entertainment. So there's this idea that uh, I'm, I have a, I'm, I'm pursuing my own private goals, the things that I, I found what I wanted deep inside me or my true self deep inside me, but then not seeing that actually the way that we're directed and, and, uh, and moved um, is dictated by um, consumerism. So uh, I think an interesting uh, way to um, example is um, the incel uh, community. I don't know the on there. They are on the internet. <laughs> they have a community. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, um, an incel they I it refers to someone who is involuntarily celibate. Um, it's uh, tends to be male um, who and they are. Um, angry uh, about um, their kind of status in the sexual marketplace. Um, and uh, this um, particular feminist theorist talks about incels um, in relation to neoliberalism and how neoliberal subjectivity um, uh, kind of can explain some things going on with incels. So, um, Instead of uh, the claim is that they are involuntarily celibate, though this author um, says that it's not intimacy, it's not a relationship, it's not even really sex that is um, that uh, they're after. So here's a quote: um, "Incels crave status, the status that having sex with high-status women confers, and the status that they see as the price of access to high-status women." So, um, and at the same time, incels oppose themselves to a sexual market in which they see themselves as losers while being wedded to the status hierarchy that structures that market. So um, to explain that a little bit more, the, um, there is a, um, they're aggrieved by this um, idea that they are not um, high on uh, high status that they are perceived that way because of the shape of their jawline or you know, whatever features that they have. They're angry about that, but they're also very attached to um, the, the female qualities that we, um, uh, that we prize, that, we, um, uh, that are conventionally uh, considered to be attractive. So they're wedded to the status hierarchy, but they're angry about how it applies to them. So it's it's just an interesting way to think about this. And I think that um, it's not, you may not have a client who is part of um, incel groups, but I think that it's very common to have um, clients who may not realize, that, that, that may have some of these impulses uh, interfering with having true relationships that they may be um, thinking hierarchically, thinking about status and thinking about marketability in, in these subtle ways. And, um, it, you know, it's our job to kind of direct them to uh, relationality and, um, and help them explore these things. So, um, so if the neoliberal self 
um, has their destiny is in their own hands. It's up to them to uh, direct their lives to to um, figure out what their values are as an individual and um, articulate what it is that they are all about. So um, autonomous and self-contained. Um, survival is an individual responsibility. It's not um, something that's um, socially supported or, or something we're responsible for together to help each other survive. So the um, the removal of dependence on the social fabric combined with the dream of wealth and possessions for each individual who gets it right. So it's it's on it's on each of us to be the one that gets it right. Um, this is a quote from John the Thin Chambers Christopher. Uh, quote: Society becomes the arena where relatively autonomous and self-contained people who already contain their own objectives, needs, desires interests, potentialities, and rights express and act on these inner attributes. Such an individual should be self-defining, able to step back from his or her life and rationally determine the best manner of pursuing self-chosen goals and interests. And what matters above all and what is most essential to our personhood are not the ends we choose, but our capacity to choose them. So the burden is on the self and you can imagine with um, all of these things being up to us as individuals, when in the past we've relied on um, institutions, leaders to determine some of these things, communities that we were born into. And now that burden is strictly with the self. So you can imagine that this develops its own set of issues for the individual. So, um, so while pernicious for the individual, uh, decontextualizing the self, uh, isolating the self, leads to collective problems as well. So uh, the dangers that such an extreme preoccupation with the inner self causes the wor social wor world to be devalued or ignored, except to the degree that it mirrors and thus becomes appropriated by the self. The social thus loses its impact as a material force and social problems lose their relation to political action. So in other words, the people have no power when they're not able to see their connectedness and responsibility to each other, which in this country puts the power in the hands of the privileged and wealthy few if we are not able to see how um, our, um, our problems in living, our social problems are connected to one another. So implications for the field. Uh, Cushman, Philip Cushman talks about this quite a bit um, and talks about how psychotherapy has contributed to these problems. So here's a quote, uh, psychotherapy theories draw attention away from the socio-political causes of psychological suffering by contributing to self-contained individualism, the configuring of the empty self and the normalizing of the motives and consequences of the dominant consumer ethos. So, um, what Cushman's saying there is that we're reinforcing um, this relationship with the self and others um, and that has been influenced by neoliberalism. So uh, I want to talk about um, some, how that's kind of manifesting itself in culture currently and what that looks like with the clients that we are seeing. Um, but first I want to give a little snapshot of the 70s where I see a lot of the, um, uh, the roots of, of of this kind of um, approach to ourselves and also to uh, the world around us. <clears throat> so um, Christopher Lash, who wrote The Culture of Narcissism uh, in 1979, uh, he claims that after political tumult of the 60s, Americans wanted to settle into purely personal endeavors, having lost hope that the quality of their lives could actually improve collectively. So instead, they focus on, um, so people would focus instead on psychic self-improvement. They would take on new hobbies, do dance aerobics, eat healthier. Um, it sounds very familiar in general, but also I, I think particularly during COVID, um, this was a way that we coped with um, a very chaotic uh, world around us. So uh, Lash states, 
Harmless in themselves, these pursuits, elevated to a program and wrapped in the rhetoric of authenticity and awareness, signify a retreat from politics and a repudiation of the recent past. Indeed, Americans seem to wish to forget not only the 60s, the riots, the new left, the disruptions on college campuses, Vietnam, Watergate, and the Nixon presidency, but their entire collective past. So this is the idea again that um, we want to be autonomous individuals. We don't want to be influenced by uh, bureaucracy or tradition, um, that that is actually uh, a sign that you're not an individual and you um, are not free. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're calling the identitarian left. But um, Aram and I have both been in activist circles and um, uh, just people out in the world and here in Pittsburgh. And uh, what uh, we see is um, in a lot of uh, efforts um, to address issues um, that there are, there's a focus on individual solutions for these social problems. So um, macro level problems like poverty, racism, and sexism are often addressed through individual actions, through um, the statements or the, uh, that we make uh, on Twitter, through the things that we post on Instagram or, or, ta or you know, repost. Um, and uh, it's, those, are, those are ways to show that you, um, as an individual, are, are addressing or, cons or considering these issues. Um, there's, it's also, um, how can I use the correct language? How can I educate myself and improve myself and have the most virtuous conduct that then will um, address a, a, a problem? like re racism or sexism. Um, if I have these, these proper, like these manners, then you know, the idea that that will produce some kind of structural change as important as it is um, to a certain degree. Um, and so that we also look at um, representation politics is a big thing that um, there's some, that representation is important, but this, um, idea that there is something inherent in representation that is revolutionary is um, something that is, seems to be adapted by this um, way of thinking. Um, there's also a demand for recognition. Um, individuals are encouraged to find themselves to, um, you know, uh, excavate like this uniqueness that's within them, but then also however they express that identity, um, that that needs to be recognized by others to be coherent. And uh, even antinomian identities need to be accepted. So um, things that were subcultural, we want recognized in the mainstream, which, which works great with a neoliberal um, agenda because it can be co-opted. It can, uh, you can uh, have products sold to you. Anything that, any expression that you have, if it can be um, sold back to you, then it's, it's valuable. Um, and so, uh, along with this, personal preferences are beyond criticism. So we can't, um, if everything's a consumer choice, it's all just your taste and that's personal to you and that's what makes you unique. So, um, we love Philip Cushman here. Uh, here's another quote from him. Uh, Rather than seeing themselves humans, as historical beings embedded within the larger communal matrix and their own personal history, they usually devalue their communal ties and believe themselves to be emancipated from their earlier lives and former beliefs. This reproduces the isolation and moral confusion that are among the greatest problems of our time. So can we talk about identities? Um, this is central to um, uh, kind of the uh, cultural moment. Um, so freedom to pursue happiness is defined by the individual. So we have a self-referential moral, moral order. Um, and so therefore identities are beyond critique and, and question because it's, it's up to each of us and it's equally valid what we each come up with as far as what uh, our morals and, and values are. 
Um, differences that threaten recognition cannot be engaged with, which this is a problem in the therapy space because we, um, we do want to know what these, um, what identities or what um, parts of people mean to them in particular. And there shouldn't be an, um, I, I don't want to make the assumption that um, I can recognize what those are and what those mean to the person. So sometimes this um, curiosity can be seen as a threatening recognition um, and it encourages monologism as well. Um, just uh, that uh, instead of instead of being in dialogue, um, feeling that you control the frame and that it should be acknowledged as you have it in place. Um, and there's also a tacitly liberal value system. Again, not allowed to criticize enjoyment and experience, this kind of relativization of uh, tastes and uh, interests. So many of our clients lack interpersonal bonds that are permanent and unchosen, kind of have that familial, stable feel to them. Um, modern rhetoric says if a person's toxic, then they should be cut out. So there's, the, there's that fear that you know, you're temporary that, um, that, that creates like a, a precarity in your relationships. Um, and it also encourages the individual not to uh, work through problems with, within their, within their relationships. So um, another important thing is, is the alienation piece categories of identity may fit the client or the individual imperfectly. So um, identity categories can presume a shared life experience. And it's important that therapists don't assume what the client's experience is. Um, and uh, what um, I've seen a lot of is uh, people feeling like they should fit into that category and, um, or fit the, you know, kind of how um, they imagine uh, that their category, their identity responding to a certain situation and, and it's been important to help them have a looser sense of that and to know to, and to be curious about the ways that it uh, their identity doesn't fit them perfectly or that um, things you know it, we don't want to foreclose on uh, complexity just so we can have a nicely packaged narrative right so um, people make different meanings of the same life experiences so we don't want to essentialize experience All right, thank you, Anna. That was very well said. Um, so I want to talk about hermeneutics as a possible way to address some of these problems um, and as a sort of countermeasure to this radical individualism. So uh, the natural science approach um, and really I think the basis of, of individualism is based on a Cartesian dualistic vision of the self in which the mind and the world are separate consciousness and the world are separate so descartes formulated his dictum cogito ergo sum through a process of suspending his presuppositions and assumptions about reality and finding that the only thing that he could be absolutely certain of was that he existed as a thinking subject um, so in in much the same way natural science methods hold that we should approach in investigations into the world from an impersonal, abstracted perspective of objectivity. Uh, in psychological science, this approach is manifested as value neutrality, in which the therapist hopes to encounter difference from a non-judgmental, unbiased point of view, which does not allow their personal values to affect their relationship with the patient. Um, so hermeneutics comes in here. It's based on, a, it's based on textual criti criticism. Uh, originally, hermeneutics was concerned with the question of textual meaning and exploring the relationship between audience and author. Um, now, this gets applied to psychotherapy using the ontology of the philosopher um, Martin Heidegger. And Heidegger says that in, in contrast to this Cartesian vision in which the mind and the world are separate, that consciousness participates in the world and that the self is situated in the world and culture. As soon as we perceive something, we are perceiving it through a lens of culture. Uh, and, and we can't step outside of that perspective. We can't um, unknow uh, these cultural things. We, we can't un, 
uh, step outside of our values, step outside of the way that we live and the way that we think. So objectivity from this perspective is impossible. Uh, there's no pure perspective with the cultural, you know, if you sweep the cultural values away, you're not getting closer to reality. Uh, you're actually getting further away from it by getting more and more abstract. Uh, the everyday way that we encounter the world is, for, he for Heidegger, the most authentic um, and primordial way of experiencing the world. So it's important to note that when psychologists try to be value neutral, uh, those stances actually also carry values. They just carry them implicitly or covertly. They're not acknowledged. Uh, there are presuppositions that we carry with us that we cannot step outside of. So from this Heideggerian perspective, the subject is created by relationships with others, uh, both on the individual and family level, you know, the, the sort of family drama, and also on the social level, the societal level. And there's no true self without cultural values. At the very basis, we have culture in, inside of us. Um, another aspect of hermeneutic, of hermeneutic philosophy that is important is that hermeneutics um, has a perspectival approach to truth. So because there's no objective point of view, there's also no objective truth. Um, different people with different perspectives will each uh, bring a certain perspective on the truth. They have a part of the truth or they have one type of truth, um, but there's no one truth that's more right than the other. Um, now, as we'll see, it's not that there's no truth or that you can formulate anything, uh, say anything about the world, but rather that, uh, again, we each have a part of the truth. So Donald Stern, who's a, a psychologist who works in the hermeneutic paradigm, says prejudice is not only the bane of new experience, but the source of it. Hans Georg Gadamer looks to prejudice as both what makes possible new understanding and what stands in its way. Without prejudices, we would be free to formulate anything at all and unable to make a single thought. So uh, Gadamer is another philosopher uh, who was also heavily influenced by Hegel, or I'm sorry, by Heidegger, and um, he is kind of the, ba the philosophical basis from which most uh, psychological hermeneutics draws. And Gadamer had this concept of prejudice, but this is separate from our usual pejorative use of the term. Uh, prejudices are the perspectives, the situated cultural historical perspectives from which we are always experiencing the world. And the prejudices are the values that we are bringing to uh, experience. So this all this quote sounds quite paradoxical that it's the bane of new experience, but also its source. Well, what what Stern is saying here is that without prejudices, without some kind of cultural knowledge, we would be totally unable to experience the world. It would just be, uh, you know, an undifferentiated swirling, you know, mass without separate objects and uh, co concepts of cause and effect. We are bringing um, cultural values every time that we are perceiving anything, but it also limits what we're able to see because we're not able to perceive things from perspectives other than our own. So it is also the bane of new experience. So Gadamer also has another, another term called the horizon, which he considers to be the sum of all prejudices. All of the pre-reflective, that is to say, mostly unconscious cultural information that allows us to sensibly engage with the world. So the horizon takes in everything that you can, that you can experience and conceptualize from your prejudice, from your particular point of view. Now, when you enter into dialogue with someone, something special takes place. Uh, and it's called the fusion of horizons. So your horizons, your particular set of meanings uh, that you're bringing from your perspective and my set of meanings from my perspective merge. And through this encounter, new meaning is created. So these meanings don't belong to me or to, or to you in this dialogue, but they emerge between us from our separate perspectives merging. And both or all members of a, of a dialogue can come off better from this experience, from this encounter, because it gives us new perspective. It gives us new cultural information. Uh, it allows us to see the world in a way that we did not before. Now, um, 
uh, Frank Richardson here has a quote, hermeneutic th thinkers suggest that a searching dialogue with others whose convictions differ from our own is a more powerful means for detecting dogmatism and domination than liberal individualism's reliance on abstract principles of justice or fairness coupled with rendering all notions of the good merely subjective and preferential. In other words, what, what Richardson is saying here is that um, when notions of the good are merely subjective and preferential, this is like in neoliberalism when our ideas of the good life uh, are like consumer products. They're all equal, um, they're all acceptable, they are treated as, you know, we are all treated as equals uh, in the arena of the marketplace, right? So uh, in contrast to that, having a real interpersonal connection, a dialogue where there's a fusion of horizons, um, this is a better way of dealing with domination and dogmatism as they emerge. And because um, dialogue isn't about convincing the other person, it's not about making someone agree with you, and it's not about uh, you know necessarily taking on someone else's perspective uh, as your own, but it's, it's about understanding the other person's perspective, understanding what they're saying, not necessarily agreeing to it and vice versa. So because dialogue is kind of this give and take and we are trying to achieve understanding uh, more so than agreement, dialogue never reaches a definite end. So um, hermeneuticists speak of understanding as an alternative to universal conceptions of truth. As I, as I mentioned um, in hermeneutics, there is no uh, you know, objective truth. And um, because meaning is given by the specific social and historical situatedness of a particular being, the way that each person encounters the world is necessarily different. Now, when we take on these identities, um, sort of as, as Anna was addressing earlier, sometimes we're subordinating our own experience to a group experience or to a group identity. We're making identity, our experiences, um, understandable to others by putting them in this category of I'm an, you know, I am an X kind of person. Um, and there are sort of assumed narratives and uh, stereotypes that and values that go along with that, uh, which may or may not actually fit uh, your individual experience. Uh, it sort of effaces the differences and the multiplicity and the, you know, multivocity of experience within these groups. Uh, so I think that this is an important thing to remember when we're talking about um, a hermeneutic approach is that we're really talking about the individual who's across from us in the chair, in the therapeutic space, uh, being treated as an individual, as a person with a unique experience that no amount of knowledge about their culture or no amount of empirical uh, studies can really f substitute for. Um, you know, we, there's a sort of cultural competence model that's very popular in psychology that sort of suggests that we should all teach ourselves about different people's cultures and that we, through research, we can find out how to best deliver services to X kind of client. Um, and hermeneutics explodes this and says, no, no, really what you want is to um, enter into dialogue in a way knowing, you know, suspending your what you know about the person and, and sort of meeting them where they are and learning about them with this curiosity and hu humility. Um, and uh, so the participants in a hermeneutic dialogue do not pretend to represent neutral or universal viewpoints. Uh, each is entering from a specific perspective and speaks passionately for their beliefs. Again, uh, it's not about convincing the other person or, or accepting their values, but hermeneutic dialogue requires radical openness to challenge and to change. And even your most uh, deeply held beliefs, your identity itself may be called into question and challenge by a hermeneutic dialogue. Um, so the hermeneutic critique of the possibility of objectivity, I just want to finish by saying this, uh, does not necessarily lead to total relativism in which any interpretation of reality is potentially valid. That latter view is a sort of straw man version of postmodernism, maybe not the most nuanced or fair uh, characterization, but um, postmodernism shares with hermeneuticism a multiple perspectival view of truth, but there are crucial differences because ep epistemologically hermeneutics um, 
does not mean that a listener in a, or a participant in a dialogue can legitimately ascribe any meaning to a discourse. Uh, rather, the views of each participant in a dialogue are interpretations based on their experience and their cultural historical situation. Participants have a part of the truth or an aspect of the truth from their pers particular specific per perspective. And what's at stake in the distinction between hermeneutics and postmodernism is the possibility of making a meaningful critique. So in a therapeutic setting, for example, a patient might enter therapy with an asexual identity. The patient believes that her identity is natural or biological, that she was born this way, uh, and that her problems of living are completely separate from this identity. So a postmodernist or social constructivist might rightly note that there are many historical uh, accounts of asexual people and raise the patient's awareness of the social narratives portraying sexuality as compulsory and uh, integral to the good life. A hermeneuticist, on the other hand, would explore the patient's asexuality with curiosity, being aware of their own values around sexuality, which may or may not correspond to dominant cultural narratives, and seek a more personal and historical understanding of the patient's relationship to her body and those of others. This is not, to be clear, pathologizing asexuality, but merely remaining open to the possibility that it is a symptom and not a monolithic natural phenomenon which cannot be addressed in the therapeutic space. So a, a hermeneutic approach pertains to identitarianism by giving the therapist a ground to explore and critique the patient's values in a non-dogmatic and equal field of dialogue. Um, and the hermeneutic therapist does not act as a cultural imperialist imposing his vision of the good life on the patient, but rather encourages the patient to make their own values and good life explicit and dialogue about them. So hermeneutic therapy is therefore inescapably moral and political. A hermeneutic therapist realizes that when a patient improves, they are improving towards something. There's an implicit view of the good life when we talk about someone getting better. Um, and that vision is co-created in the therapeutic space in dialogue with the participation of both the therapist and the patient. The way that values are lived spills over into all aspects of life and um, Often the suffering that we designate as modern, uh, as mental illness in our culture is at its core a conflict of values. And it's here that hermeneutic dialogue can shed light on new ways of living. And at other times, problems of living arise from conceptions of the self, which is also reflects values. And in these cases, the therapist's perspective may offer a different way of seeing oneself or bring recognition to aspects of the self that are disavowed and repudiated. In sum, hermeneutics allows us to understand that there's a third way between cultural determinism and the bounded, masterful self of neoliberal radical individualism. For the hermeneuticist, group experiences, culture, uh, do define the individual's experience, but as a ground for personal experience and autonomous choice. As such, there is no monolithic Asian immigrant experience or lesbian identity, for example, because these identity positions are articulated uniquely through the lived reality of individuals. Hermeneutically informed therapy by entering into dialogue with an attitude of humility and curiosity seeks to understand these lived realities as particular and unique and posits that in genuine openness, the horizon of experience can be shared. Thus, hermeneutic psychotherapy offers the possibility of community communication and healing in a world of fragmentation and radical individualism. Thanks very much. And um, thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah. I uh, want to leave enough time for questions, but we'd be happy to talk more about what we've been seeing with our clients and how this relates. Uh, thank you, Division 32. Thanks very much.